Dr. Rob Silverman here, Amazon best-selling author of Inside Out Health and ACA Sports Council Chiropractor Year 2015. I'm here for part two of proton pump inhibitors. Um, got a lot of great questions, a lot of feedback. I seem to have hit a real chord talking about these PPIs. And without question, when you really analyze the usage, or if you will, what I believe is the overusage of PPIs, you're going to find out two things. One, they are one of the top 10 most prescribed medications. And number two, you're going to find that they're a tremendous, um, uh, they are used tremendously as over-the-counter drugs. Some of the questions that I really want to address is the mechanism of action. How do they work? We all know that they're acid blockers, but what happens is they're specialized cells in the stomach that actually enable a split of water into ions, protons, and hydroxide. So it splits it into these three particles. Then the pump, it pumps out protons. So these specialized cells, which are called parietal cells in the stomach, actually pump out the protons. Those protons are essential step in making what we call HCL. HCL is known to help digest foods and absorb nutrients. PPI use decreased production of acid by stopping this protein pump. And that's why they're called, obviously, protein pump inhibitors. Interestingly enough, uh, the thing that I wanted to talk about is the nutrients, the nutrients that may be depleted. So if obviously if these nutrients are depleted, these are the nutrients that you want to take if you've taken a PPI or you're currently taking any kind of PPI. Number one, let's talk about calcium. Calcium in a low acidic environment reduces the amount available for bone building. So calcium is a critical element in that it's critical for bone health. It's critical for osteoporosis, osteopenia, that low acidic environment. And you're going to get a low acidic environment in your gut when you take PPIs, your gut and your stomach. That low acidic environment with not allowing calcium to be absorbed, you can increase the risk of fracture. So interesting, people always come in, and again, this may magnify the idea of what functional medicine is. Functional medicine speaks to the idea of getting to what we call root cause resolution and not looking at the symptomology. So people come in and may say they have osteoporosis. They may be on PPIs for years, a female, for years, and you're looking at just giving a calcium, but the calcium is not enough. You've got to get to the root cause and understand some of these drug nutrient depletions. Chromium is another vital mineral that can be depleted if you're on PPIs. Chromium are great if you have it as this mineral because it's excellent for blood sugar absorption and metabolism. So once again, you can attribute some issues possibly with blood sugar issues to the idea of PPIs and the decrease or depletion of chromium. Iron, stomach acids environment is necessary to assist the utilization of plant iron sources. So obviously iron is a critical element. We could talk about all the anemias, if you take iron in this instance, you want to take it combined with vitamin C for extra intestinal absorption. Zinc, to me, one of the gem minerals. Zinc gets absorbed in an acidic environment. It actually does not get absorbed in the acidic environment. That poses an issue. Zinc is a critical element. It, look at all the uh, talk about the immune system now and the usage of zinc. So without question, zinc helps with up to about 300 enzymatic um, enzymes. The brand, or if you will, the formulation or the uh, type of zinc I like is zinc carnosine. Zinc carnosine is fabulous for what we call tight junctions in the gut. And we're talking about gut health here with PPIs. So that would be my recommendation. I always use zinc carnosine with anybody that has leaky gut or SIBO. We're going to talk about leaky gut in a couple of minutes. Magnesium. Magnesium, the choice mineral. Magnesium is the most common mineral that Americans are deficient or de uh, depleted in now. Couple that with the use of PPIs. PPIs decrease intestinal magnesium levels. So we want to take magnesium. I'm a proponent of taking magnesium bisglycinate. Bisglycinate is attached to amino acid to allow for absorption and not to be damaged through the stomach. Magnesium uh, glycinate is that choice. So I strongly recommend that. Take it with calcium to get that two to one ratio. And I would take them both at night. Other nutrients that may be depleted are vitamin B12. So B12 has a lengthy explanation in that it's reduced stomach acid can cause B12 deficiency, but not by activating acid dependent enzymes. 
that separate B12 from proteins, also by allowing bacterial overgrowth that consume additional B12 in the stomach, actually in the upper small intestine. So B12 is a major issue. You're going to get that B12 deficiency. Think of pernicious anemia. Now for me, the big deal is betaine HCL. That's known as a hydrochloric acid donor. This is a critical element. This is something that we're all talking about. This is your stomach acid. This supports the body's natural production of stomach acid. It will help with the digestion of stomach acid. So you always want to take betaine HCL. So if you have a problem with protein, you have a problem with stomach digestion, it's probably because you have too low stomach acids, which really segues into the idea of why are these people taking these PPIs? They're taking these PPIs for the simple reason that they think they have too much stomach acid, which is not typically the problem. They have too little stomach acid and they're depleting them more by decreasing the usage and the effectiveness of the parietal cells. I just wanna take a moment before we go ask any questions and say hi to everybody making a comment for part two. The idea that I wanna talk about is leaky gut. Now, PPIs can lead you down a path over duration of time of leaky gut or what we like to refer to as increased intestinal permeability. I'm going to be doing some upcoming presentations. Those presentations are going to be pointed at leaky gut, and I'm going to be applying my seven-hour action plan. My seven-hour action plan, just in epigrammatic fashion, number one, you want to reset. Reset what? Reset your lifestyle. Reset your diet. Reset your mind. When can you do that? You can do that right now. I had a patient yesterday that we made some supplemental suggestions and she said, well, I can't get one supplement. It's back ordered. So I should wait for the whole program. No, make your food choices right now. You're going to the stove right now. Instead of frying the chicken, grill the chicken. Instead of, you know, putting it in with skin, take the skin off. Things like that. Make a better choice. Don't go for the crackers. Go for the sweet potato go for the avocado. So you can make those choices, those implementable lifestyle choices right now. So when you reset, there's no time, meaning you don't have to wait six months for something. You can do it in the next six minutes. Remove. The remove phase. What do you want to remove at that point? You want to remove bacteria, viruses, pathogens, anything that can be an antigen and environmental toxins. My remove phase is very unique in that I combine detox with the typical remove phase of other people's R programs. So I do detox because there's a gut to liver axis that I want to address. And environmental toxins pose an issue because they also can damage the gut and toxins that come through the gut go to the liver because they are what we call bi-directional. Now, having said all that, remove, remove bacteria, remove viruses, remove those things that can be antigens. I use specific herbs and minerals like oregano oil. I like an emulsified oregano oil. It helps clear out the upper uh, GI tract airway. I also like to clear out the lower GI tract. I, love, I do so with a lot of berberine, berberine HCL, and a very secret serum bovine immunoglobin, which is a non-dairy way of what I call mopping the gut and getting rid of the antigen. So that combined with a detox takes care of the remove phase, the replace phase. You probably heard a little bit about the replace phase because we just talked about it. Replace what? Digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, and um, bile. So it's very interesting. Some real keys. I'll give you a little insight into my book. You know, I'm always trying to give tidbits for my book. The number one insight will be if you have a problem with protein, you have a stomach acid issue. If you have a problem with carbohydrates, you have a pancreatic enzyme issue. If you have trouble with fats, you have a bile issue. Bile is that emulsifier. Bile is a great choice. Most people have a bile and a gallbladder problem. Those problems will lead you down that deleterious path of possibly having an increase in leaky gut and SIBO. So obviously, we're going to replace digestive enzymes both in the stomach, the pancreas, and obviously ox bile, bile acids. That's going to take care of the replace phase, the regeneration phase, repair, heal and seal the gut lining, add structure to those damaged tight junctions, making sure that something called LPS lipopolysaccharide does not get through the leaky gut, which is an endotoxin. All of this can come a contributor to all of this would be the use or the overuse, if you will, of PPIs. In the regeneration phase, we're going to use a lot of different nutrients. There's a plethora of them, aloe vera, L-glutamine, zinc carnosine, omega-3 fatty acids, 
vitamin D, glucosamine HCL, NAG, et cetera. They're all gonna be pointed at two different things, allowing for structure, helping with the structure of the gut epithelial lining to grow back, and also creating a microenvironment in the gut of anti-inflammation. Number five, re-inoculate. re, re with what? Pre and probiotics. We talk so much about prebiotics, some of the great food prebiotics or any kind of fermented foods, sauerkraut, fermented foods, pickles, great choice. Of course, not the cucumber, but the pickle. So you're going to put that in with specific probiotics. The probiotics that come to mind are going to be bacillus subtilis, like the bacillus acidophilus, bifidobactam, etc. The key to probiotics for me is always having a diversity in the probiotics. Don't take the same probiotic forever. Switch them. There's a little clinical gem there. The next step would be what I call reintroduce and retest. So you want to retest. So I do a lot of testing because I don't believe in testing, not guessing. I can't manage it if I can't measure it. So I'm going to test. So those may be some food sensitivity tests, blood tests, maybe a replication of a stool test, saliva test, et cetera. We're going to reintroduce. If we didn't do the tests and we took out the inflammatory foods or the top list of inflammatory foods, gluten, dairy, eggs, peanuts, et cetera, we're going to reintroduce one food at a time for 72 hours to see if and when you get any symptomology. If you don't get any symptomology, great job. And that means that we heal the gut and your issues were from a leaky gut, like a food sensitivity. Now, one little side with the food sensitivity, a food sensitivity implies that you have leaky gut and a digestion problem. So with all that being said, that's the reintroduction phase and then the retain. Retain what? Your gut health. Try not to be on PPIs. Now, the retain phase is really individualized and personalized for every one of my patient's genetic potential. But clearly some of the things that I use very often on a more everyday thing, after starting with diet, a good healthy diet, I call it my diets the flex diets because I'm flexible in finding what works for the individual. Flex diets in reference to what we call TRE, time restrictive eating. Now with us covering all that, also some of the supplements that are typical, not individualized, would be D3 with K2, omega-3 fatty acids, a good probiotic, and without question, a blessed multivitamin, multimineral with phytonutrients to help stimulate and support our immune system. So it's time to take a look. We've got some people giving us some conversations. Uh, gastric guy. So we have some people mentioning some products by Zymogen. That's great. Um, I, I happen not to be a Zymogen user, uh, but that's fine. If you, if you find that works for you, I use different companies. If you're interested, give me a buzz. Um, why do people have too little stomach acid? Great question. Most people have too, too little stomach acid because they don't have good digestion. Other reasons, especially for this, I'm going to give you the answer is PPIs. Hey, Rob, if off, if often the problem is that people have too, too low, too low level of stomach acid, why assuming PPI, their gastric symptoms are getting better? I guess you mean getting better. Well, drugs are great. They mask the symptom, but they don't resolve the problem. And the PPI is a great example of that. So next week, we'll be back. We'll be back on Monday, approximately 1.30. Please share, comment if you like, share this with everybody. Come back and see me. We're on two to three times every week. We're anywhere between one and two o'clock. I hope to hear from you. Let me know what topics you'd like me to cover. I'm here for you. So everybody have a great weekend. Dr. Rob, who is yours in health?